Good morning. Welcome to the draft SEIS public meeting for the Glen Canyon Dam Long-Term Experimental and Management Plan Draft Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement. Um, there were a few of you kind of waiting in the wings. We're going to give it a few more minutes to see who else joins our, uh, our webinar this morning. So glad you're all here. Good morning and welcome to the draft SEIS public meeting for the Glen Canyon Dam long-term experimental and management plan. Just gonna give it one more minute to see if anyone else joins our webinar this morning and then we'll get started. Okay, I think we're ready to begin. So once again, welcome to the draft SEIS public meeting for the Glen Canyon Dam Long-Term Experimental and Management Plan Draft Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement. You are attending one of three virtual public draft SEIS meetings uh, today, February 16th. There will also be a draft public excuse me, virtual public draft SEIS meetings on the 20th and the 22nd of February. If you are joining us and having any technical difficulties this morning, uh, you may email Jessica Sams at jessica.sams at swca.com. So my name is Sarah Lupus and I will be the facilitator for today's meeting. I'd like to just give you a quick overview of our plan for this webinar. So we're gonna start with some introductory remarks and a welcome from Reclamation, followed by a presentation. And then we'll have a question and answer session where we'll take on some of the, your questions. And then we'll have some closing remarks and wrap up at 11.30 Mountain Time. It's possible that you will have more questions um, than we'll take, we'll, we will be taking questions as time allows and it's possible that there will be more questions um, than we have time for uh, in this webinar, but rest assured that we will follow up with any questions that have not yet been answered uh, live. So just to give you some orientation to this Zoom webinar platform, um, this webinar is being recorded. Your microphones are muted and your chat feature is turned off. If you have questions during the presentation, you can submit those at any time using the Q&A um, feature in, in this Zoom webinar. So you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that button, a box will pop up, you can type in your question, click send. Our panel will be working behind the scenes on responses to your questions, 
And uh, during the Q&A portion of our meeting, we will cover as many of those questions uh, as we possibly can. And responses, I will both read them out loud and I will also be sharing them with you back in the Q&A box. And please do note that questions submitted during this, uh, this webinar will not be part of the project record. We'll explain a little bit more uh, during the presentation about how to submit your comments on the draft SEIS. Right now though, I would like to turn it over to Wayne Pullen, Regional Director with the Bureau of Reclamation for the Upper Colorado Basin Region. Wayne? If you'd like to start your video and come off mute, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for your interest and your concern about the uh, issues involved in this LTEMP uh, SEIS. We appreciate your, uh, your attention and your concern. Uh, this webinar is important to us. It represents the fulfilling of an important obligation we have to report on our work to the public, and it is uh, an important part of garnering uh, comments to the SCIS. In 2021, the humpback chub was downlisted from endangered to threatened, which was a huge milestone. And that milestone was possible largely because of the populations located downstream of Glen Canyon Dam in the Grand Canyon. Uh, Reclamation and our partners have and will continue to work together to ensure the best possible future for these uh, populations of, of the humpback chub. Because of the emerging issues and because of the potential threats to, uh, to the humpback chub, this, this effort has been undertaken on a, a very accelerated schedule. Uh, back in August, Reclamation was directed to convert the smallmouth bass environmental assessment to an LTEMP supplemental environmental impact statement. At that time, I wasn't sure we'd be able to meet the expedited timelines associated with completing an, EI, an SEIS in time to take actions this summer. And this summer may be Reclamation's best opportunity to adjust the timing of flows from the dam to prevent further spawning of smallmouth bass and other invasive predatory fish. And because of the support of our cooperating agencies, uh, the USGS, uh, WAPA, and other uh, adaptive management work group partners, Reclamation has been able to prepare a draft SEIS that is now ready for public comment. It's been a remarkable effort, and I'd like to express my gratitude to uh, our cooperating agencies, to our contractors, and uh, to our, uh, our friends at USGS, and also to our reclamation team for doing such a remarkable job. The next step in the NEPA process is for the public to provide their comments on the draft SEIS. And this webinar is uh, part of and a good start to that process. As part of this public webinar, I'd encourage you to ask clarifying questions, and I'd also encourage you to submit written comments on the substance of the draft SEIS. Uh, public review and comments are an integral part of the NEPA process, and we certainly welcome your input. Before I turn it over to the team, I want to reiterate that the LTEMP SEIS is one step in a process that Reclamation is undertaking to address short-term, middle-term, and long-term impacts of non-native predatory fish on native fish species, especially the threatened humpback chub. So with that, I will turn things back to Sarah. Thank you, Wayne. Appreciate that. So now we would like to move into the presentation portion of this webinar. Um, and for that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Good morning, everyone. So we are going to um, spend a little time on the presentation. We have quite a few slides, but um, we hope to get through them in plenty of time for questions at the end. So um, we're going to start with a little bit of background. This will be repeat for some folks, um, a couple slides on project overview. 
we'll spend some time going over the alternatives, and then we'll spend some time going over the analysis of impacts. So we'll start with the background. All right, in December 2016, Reclamation signed a record of decision for the LTEM. Um, the LTEM provides a framework for adaptively managing Grand Canyon Dam operations to be consistent with the Grand Canyon Protection Act. It identifies options for dam operations based on the timing of hourly, daily, and monthly flows. It also gives us a framework for experimental and management actions that meet the requirements of the Grand Canyon Protection Act. It also addresses hydropower production and ways to improve downstream resources, including those important to American Indian tribes. Um, warm water native species are a concern. Um, they started a few years ago, um, but now they're really becoming a concern because of the prolonged drought in the Colorado River Basin. Um, this drought is resulting in lower reservoir elevations um, and the upper layer of water where most fish reside is closer to the Glen Canyon Dam intakes. Um, this is allowing for non-native fish in Lake Powell to move through the dam and downstream into the Colorado River. The water below the dam is also now warmer, making conditions suitable for warm water non-native fish, um, including the smallmouth bass, to reproduce. Um, our concern is that these non-native predatory fish pose a threat to our federally listed species, um, the humpback chub and other native fish downstream of the dam. Um, we showed this during scoping, but I just wanted to remind everybody about the invasion curve. This is taken from the Department of Interior Invasive Species Strategic Plan. The star represents where we think we might be um, in this process, and so that's why we are trying to take action as quickly as possible to prevent us from getting into a situation where we have larger populations and the control costs are going up. All right, high flow experiments. Um, we're also looking at the high flow experimental protocol, protocol excuse me, from LTEM um, to integrate additional scientific information that we have. Um, as it says on the slide, high flow experiments further our understanding of incorporating these high water releases into future dam operations, um, which help us maintain or improve beaches, sandbars, and the associated habitat of our native species. All right. This graph is just, um, we showed this again during the scoping, but I wanted to show it again today, is the relationship of the three Colorado River planning activities that are currently underway. The important thing for me to emphasize is that the LTEMP SEIS is focusing on the sub-annual flows, especially the timing of hourly, daily, and monthly, monthly releases from Glen Canyon Dam. The other two are looking on the annual releases and volumes released from the, the two from Glen Canyon Dam. Um, also on this slide, um, this SEIS is looking at um, alternatives to implement from the window of 2024 to 2027. Um, for the HFE protocol, we are looking at a window from 2024 to 2036. All right, we'll now move on to the project overview. So on June 19th, 2023, Reclamation was directed to prepare a supplemental environmental impact statement to the 2016 record of decision for LTEM. Um, previous to that, we had prepared an environmental assessment that was published in February 2023. We received over 7,000 comments on that environmental assessment. And so the decision was made that we needed to undertake a more in-depth analysis of the alternatives. On October 4th, 2023, Reclamation published a notice of intent in the Federal Register. 
that announced the LTEMP SEIS process and requested scoping input. Based on that scoping input, we prepared this draft SEIS, and on February 9th, a notice of availability was published in the Federal Register announcing the draft LTEMP SEIS, and which started the 45-day public comment period. And if you're having trouble finding the notice in the Federal Register, it is under the Environmental Protection Agency's um, Friday notice where they publish all the environmental impact statements that are available. And please reach out if you can't find it. We can make sure we can get you a copy. All right. This map is also familiar to many folks. This just is an overview of the area we're looking at. Um, if you see up in the upper right, you'll see Glen Canyon Dam is um, indicated with an arrow. Right before, right below that is the Lee's Ferry Reach. And that purple circle oval is showing where we're seeing the smallmouth bass spawning taking place. Also on this map is down at the confluence with the Little Colorado is the core population of humpback chub that we are concerned about. All right, the proposed federal action is analyzing a range of reservoir releases um, with a varying combination of temperature and release volumes to assess the effectiveness in disrupting smallmouth bass spawning and to prevent recruitment populations from expanding. It is also examining the sediment accounting period associated with the HFB protocol already analyzed in L10. The purpose and need are explained on this slide. So the purpose of the l SEIS is for reclamation to analyze additional flow options at Glen Canyon Dam in response to the non-native smallmouth bass and other warm water non-native species recently detected directed, excuse me, recently detected directly below the dam. The need is to prevent the establishment of smallmouth bass below Glen Canyon Dam. And this is by preventing additional spawning using flows. Um, these smallmouth bass, as we talked about, could threaten core populations of our threatened humpback chub in and around the Little Colorado River. The LTEMP SEIS is also considering the HFB protocol in the LTEMP FEIS by including the latest scientific information we have available to improve reclamation's ability to implement HFE releases. Specifically, we are looking at adjusting the sediment accounting periods um, from two that we currently have to looking at an annual sediment accounting window and also looking at when we implement HFEs. All right, we have many cooperating agencies on this SEIS. Um, we made a decision early on to include all the cooperating agencies that were included on the, the original 2016 LTEMP analysis. Um, federal agencies include the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Western Area Power Administration. In addition, we have 12 state, tribal, and public utility agencies that have been helping us through this process. Um, the U.S. Geologic Survey Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center is providing the scientific and modeling support for this analysis. All right, our schedule. Um, as you can see, we have, um, we're moving farther to the right as we go along. If you see the star at the top, we are at the, at the bubble that says publication of draft SEIS with public comment period to follow. So our public comment period is gonna run through March 25th, um, 45 days. And at that point, we will start working on the final SEIS and looking at all the comments we received. Um, all the comments we received will be um, taken and we will produce a summary report of the comments that we will make available um, and it'll also be addressed and included in the final SEIS. We're hoping to publish the final SEIS in May, 2024. And 
We're hoping to have a record of decision in June 2024. There is a 30-day public review of the final SEIS that we're hoping will take place in May. And again, what is driving this schedule is the need to take action as soon as possible this summer if we see the temperatures below the dam rising to the point where smallmouth bass are spawning. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill Stewart and he's gonna take us through the alternatives analyzed. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna spend the next few minutes just uh, walking you through uh, the alternatives so that were analyzed um, in this supplemental EIS. And go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so in, in the CIS, uh, there are six alternatives that were analyzed. Uh, there's the no action alternative, and then there are five action alternatives. Of those five action alternatives, four of those are cold water alternatives that make use of the, the bypass tubes um, to cool the water. And then the fifth action alternative is the non-bypass uh, alternative. Um, of all the uh, action alternatives. Um, there's an update to the HFE protocol, and that is common to all of those action alternatives. This range of alternatives reflects inputs from reclamation, states, tribes, cooperating agencies, um, all of uh, our stakeholders and interested parties um, that provided comments both during the public uh, SEIS public comment period, as well as the um, smallmouth bass EA um, that was out for public comment uh, about a year ago this spring. Um, again, to kind of reiterate something that Kathy had said in an earlier slide is that these action alternatives um, are uh, uh, proposed to be implemented through operating year uh, 2027 for the, the smallmouth bass flows. And then the HFE protocol update is intended to be for the full duration of LTEMP, which extends through 2036. Um, the other thing to, to note um, is that the action alternatives are all triggered based on water temperatures below the dam. Specifically, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the following slides, um, when, when temperatures below the dam exceed 15.5 degrees Celsius, which has been kind of identified as a, a threshold for smallmouth bass spawning um, and the efforts that went into the modeling um, take a look at 30 hydrologic traces. Um, and many of those traces, it's important to note that um, didn't um, uh, project temperatures going um, uh, be, be above that, that threshold. Uh, but the ones that did, uh, we will present in some of the following slides. Uh, go ahead and go on to the next slide. So I'll walk through each of the uh, action alternatives here. The first one is the cool mix alternative. Um, and that's exactly it. It's a, it's a mixture of both uh, cold water uh, through the bypass tubes as well as water passing through the penstocks. You'll see on the right-hand side is a figure. This is a conceptual hydrograph of, of the alternatives. Um, the purple dashed line represents the uh, discharge through the penstocks. The amber colored, orangish colored uh, dotted line uh, represents the amount of discharge through the bypass tubes. And then the green, uh, the green line represents sort of the total discharge. So that's the combination of bypass and, and the pen stocks. And so again, this cool mix um, is, is when river temperatures below the dam uh, exceed, uh, are projected to exceed 15.5. Um, Bypass release quantity would would vary based on projected uh, temperatures and and monthly water volumes uh, to ensure um, that the minimum necessary release is needed to meet uh, the temperature goal, and this would likely need to be adjusted throughout throughout the uh, uh, the months when temperatures exceed that that temperature threshold um, and adjust those uh, likely on a weekly basis. Uh, next slide. So the next slide is is very the next alternative is very uh, similar to the cool mix, um, with the exception of uh, this alternative includes up to three eight hour flow spikes, and so what a flow spike is, um, 
is essentially you'd be running this cool mix when temperatures exceed that 15.5 degree temperature threshold. And then there would be a uh, pulse of both an increase in the bypass as well as the penstock release. Um, and the intent is to get that cold water into some of the, the marginal uh, uh, areas of the river, such as the uh, uh, slough that's at minus 12 mile, which is about three miles below the dam. Next slide. Uh, the next cold water alternative is the cold shock alternative. Again, this is one that uh, once temperatures are projected to be above that temperature threshold, um, it would induce a cold shock targeting uh, temperatures of 13 degrees uh, Celsius. Again, this is, and this is true for all the cold water alternatives is, um, uh, and, and what was modeled is looking at cooling temperatures as far down as River Mile uh, 61, which is where the confluence of the Little Colorado River is. Um, this cold shock uh, would occur uh, once a week on the weekends, uh, up to 12 weekends for 48 hours. And the way this works is um, normal operations. Uh, and then on the weekends, uh, you would lower uh, the penstock release down to a minimum of 2000 CFS and uh, increase the, the discharge again with trying to hit that target temperature of 13 degrees. Um, and, and similar to the, the cool mix, the release amount um, uh, bypass would vary based on you know temperature con conditions and, and uh, uh, volume of water being passed through. Next slide. Uh, the fourth cold water uh, alternative is a cold shock with flow spikes. So similar to what I just described in the cold shock, this would include up to um, three eight-hour flow spikes. So again, kind of ramping everything up for an eight-hour period to uh, get that cold water in some of these uh, marginal uh, habitats on the, on the river margins. Next slide. Um, and so that that's all of the uh, the cold water uh, alternatives. Um, and then there, the fifth action alternative is the non bypass alternative, and this would focus on disrupting smallmouth bass nests and spawning activities below the dam. Uh, the the uh, proposal here is to conduct uh, once a week short duration low flow releases uh, down to as low as two thousand cfs immediately followed by a short duration high flow uh, pulse. And this would be repeated weekly um, as long as temperatures are forecasted to be above 15.5 uh, degrees in areas where smallmouth bass are observed spawning like the 12-mile the slough, for example. Next slide. And then um, common to all of the alternatives, um, is the adjustment to the HFE protocol. So the current protocol has uh, two, two accounting, sediment accounting periods. The, the figure on the right um, was pulled out of the uh, 2016 um, LTEMP EIS, final EIS. Um, and this, this figure shows um, the two sediment accounting periods, uh, the fall beginning in July um, through the end of November and the spring accounting period uh, initiating in the beginning of December through the end of June. And, and at the end of each of those periods, the, the sediment accounting resets to zero. Um, the, the changes that are being proposed uh, in this uh, HFE protocol would consist of adjusting this semi-annual sediment accounting period to an annual period with, uh, with the option for a spring or a a fall um, HFE. There's also an adjustment to the implementation window um, uh, to to expand it specifically in the spring from March and April uh, to March through through June, um, based on the sediment sediment inputs. Uh, next slide. So now I'm going to move on to talk briefly about the analysis of impacts. Um, again, this will just be kind of a high-level overview. Uh, would certainly recommend um, going into the document for for uh, details on the the analysis of the impacts. Um, next slide. 
So uh, this all can be found in chapter three of the, the EIS. Um, the, the, on the screen here is the list of resources um, that, were, that were analyzed. Um, and it's based again on uh, uh, concerns that were identified during uh, scoping uh, for this SEIS as well as, as the smallmouth bass, e bass EA. Um, the 16 resources uh, on the screen that were analyzed, um, the, the left-hand column here are uh, 11 resources uh, that uh, were commented on during the public scoping period and are listed in order um, based on the number of comments received from lar largest number to smallest number. And we'll walk through each one of these resources um, uh, in this presentation. The, the resources, the five resources on the, the right, uh, starting with water quality, um, those did not receive public uh, scoping comments and we'll not be going through those in this presentation, but would certainly encourage uh, to, to read through those uh, in sections in, in chapter three of the document. Uh, next slide. So we'll start with, with uh, energy and power. This is found in section 3.3 of the document. Um, what, is, what is analyzed in this draft SEIS are two issue areas, uh, generation and economic uh, analysis. Um, and we expect to have some additional uh, modeling uh, that's not in this document, but will be in the, the final um, EIS. Uh, go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, so for uh, energy and power, uh, as it relates to generation and economic analysis, uh, uh, there were two two models that were were run and are, and are described in in the document. Uh, one by WAPA, one by the USGS Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center to look at generation and economic analysis. Uh, each of these models looked at cooling the river to different um, different river miles, just just to show a range of, of potential outcomes. Again, using the thirty hydrologic traces. Um, what's presented on this slide is based on um, triggers at of temperature at river mile sixty one, um, and it provides a range of results. Uh, from both, both the modeling efforts. Um, so for the no action alternative, uh, power generation and revenue from power sales would continue similar to historic levels depending on the hydrologic and, and grid conditions. As it relates to generation, um, all of the cold water alternatives um, estimate uh, some level of loss of power generation uh, in this range from 1.6 to 0.5% compared to the no action alternative. The greatest loss was under the cool mix alternative. Um, the smallest loss was under the cold shock in the cold shock with flow spikes for the, and this is again, is for the cold water alternatives. The non, the non bypass alternative showed a gain of power generation um, of 0.1% to 0.3%, again, relative to the no action alternative. Uh, related to economic analysis, uh, Again, all of the cold water alternatives estimated a loss of economic value that ranged from 2.2% or $26.2 million to 0.6% or $6.5 million. Uh, again, the greatest loss was under the cool mix alternative and the smallest loss was under the, um, the cold shock alternative. Uh, for the non-bypass alternative, this did show a gain of economic value of approximately 0.1% or roughly $1 million. Um, go ahead and, uh, next slide, please. So uh, moving on to the geomorphology and sediment, this is found in section 3.4. The issue areas that were identified were sediment, erosion, uh, deposition, and beach building conditions. And I'll summarize um, kind of high level results. Uh, next slide. Um, so there are a series of three figures on this slide that uh, represent uh, the probability of spring HFE, and I'll kind of I'll kind of walk through uh, these figures. Uh, so so the blue the blue line in each of these figures is the no action 
alternative. Um, and then the, the action alternatives are kind of stacked on each other. And I think you can kind of lump those together because the HFE adjustment to the HFE protocol is common to all, to all action alternatives. Um, on the y-axis of each of these figures is the HFE duration. Um, and then on the, the, uh, on the y-axis is the probability of that duration um, occurring. And so the, the figure on the left is the fall HFE probability. Figure in the middle is the spring HFE probability. And the figure on the right is the fall and spring combined HFE pro probability. And what this really is showing is that um, under the action alternatives with the adjustment to the HFE protocol, um, there, uh, the, the modeling indicated that there would be uh, uh, less probability of a fall HFE when you see the difference of the, the kind of stacked lines compared to the blue line there. Um, however, in the in the middle figure, which is the spring HFE probability, you see an increase under the action of, of uh, HFE compared to the no action. When you put it all together, uh, the, the uh, probability of, a, of an HFE occurring in any given year uh, is, is roughly the same. The difference uh, here is that for longer duration HFEs, the probability for the action alternatives under this proposed protocol adjustment um, uh, would be would be less compared to compared to no action. Next slide. Um, I think you need to go the other other direction. There we go. So. Uh, one other thing related to geomorphology and sediment uh, are the flow spike uh, alternatives. Um, so that those are those eight hour up to three flow spike alternatives. Um, in some years, flow spikes would cause sand export um, in the lead up to the HFE implementation, um, which would reduce the resulting HFE duration. And I think that was kind of um, indicated in that the, the figure on the right. Um, where they were combined. Um, and then the flow spikes would decrease uh, the mass balance at Marble Canyon to a slightly greater extent relative to the alternatives without the flow spikes while contributing slightly uh, more to uh, volume, uh, slightly more volume to sandbars. Uh, next slide. Um, so aquatic uh, resources and special status species, this can be found in uh, sections 3.5, 3.7, and 3.8 of the draft document. The issue areas focused on uh, fish, threatened endangered species, state, and tribal sensitive species, as well as, as food base. Uh, next slide. Um, so... Uh, uh, under the aquatic resources and specifically focusing on fish here, uh, under the no action alternative, uh, under lower Lake Powell elevations, uh, smallmouth bass would likely continue to pass through the dam and temperatures below the dam uh, would be suitable for spawning, uh, increasing the risk of predation on, on, nat on, native, uh, on native fish, including, uh, including the humpback chub that Kathy talked about earlier. Uh, the cold water alternatives, uh, cool temperatures could delay or disrupt uh, maturation and spawning uh, of, of smallmouth bass. Um, other fish species in the aquatic food base have experienced cool releases um, in, in the past and are not expected um, to be negatively affected. And then under the non-bypass alternative, um, this could disrupt smallmouth bass spawning by changing the water velocity. This could lead to nest abandonment and mortality of smallmouth bass eggs uh, and, and larvae. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, this slide is, is talking a bit about a smallmouth bass uh, model that was developed by Eppenheimer et al. that was used to evaluate population growth of smallmouth bass under the various alternatives that we're, we're talking about here. Um, so th this used this set of 30 hydrologic traces um, that were uh, used to evaluate smallmouth bass population growth and then to what, to what magnitude um, of growth um, would occur. Um, the results of this modeling effort are, are found in the, the SEIS and are, and are summarized here um, on this slide. And, and it's important to note that of the 30 traces um, that were analyzed, um, there were only 
five traces or 17% of those traces that showed a positive pop, smallmouth bass population growth. In, in other words, most of the traces um, did, did not result in a, in a needed action for, for the modeling purposes. And that's reflected in the no action alternative, which is the, the top uh, point there that sh where 17% of those traces showed smallmouth bass population growth um, through, through 2027. Um, the, both the cool mix and the cool mix with flow spikes alternative, um, under those alternatives, none of the traces showed a smallmouth bass population growth. Um, the cold shock and the cold shock with uh, spike flows um, up to 10% of the traces through 2027 showed a smallmouth bass population growth. And then uh, the modeling results for the non-bypass, um, similar to the no action, 17% of those um, traces showed smallmouth bass population growth. However, the growth um, uh, was smaller compared to the no, the no action alternative. Um, go ahead and go on to the next slide. Um, so uh, the, uh, Again, under this section related to aquatic food base, um, under all the cold water alternatives, uh, the cooler water temperatures are not expected to negatively affect the aquatic food base with those alternatives that included those short-term spike flows, um, potential to scour the benthos, but the food base reduction would be temporary. Uh, for the non-bypass alternative, um, high flows within the power plant's capacity are not expected to negatively affect the food base in least ferry reach or further down. However, the, those lower uh, uh, minimum flows of 2000 uh, CFS could desiccate uh, much of the, the river, river bottom. Um, and with that, I will pass it back to Kathy to talk about tribal resources. Thank you, Bill. So I'm going to be talking about tribal resources, which is in section 3.13. Um, the issue areas for this are mortality of fish, which are a contributing element to traditional cultural properties or TCPs, exposure and increased visitation to sacred sites and archaeological sites, and changes in vegetation important to tribes. Um, Why we focused on the first issue area as being mortality of fish, um, there is also a concern for aquatic species as a whole within the river. All right, under the no action alternative, there would be no change in fish mortality. Um, there would be no additional impacts on archaeological or sacred sites or, um, or our, excuse me, there would be no impacts on archaeological or sacred sites and the repairing vegetation would follow current trends. Under all the cold water alternatives, there are no additional impacts on archaeological or sacred sites. And under the all action alternatives, the differences in vegetation communities would be minor. For tribal resources, um, under the cool mix alternative, there would be no fish mortality. Under the cool mix with spike flow alternative, there may be some fish mortality. Under the cold shock and the cold shock with flow spike alternatives, we saw through the analysis, there may be egg or larval fish mortality. And for the non-bypass alternative, um, that would result in a loss of life of eggs and fry, and the low flows could result in the exposure of archaeological sites and sacred sites. For cultural resources, which is included in section 3.12, the issue areas were exposure of and increased visitation to historic properties and other cultural resources as river levels fluctuate. Um, the other issue area was sediment availability for windborne transport to protect resources downstream of the dam. And that sediment availability um, refers to um, windblown sand being blown over to protect archaeological and cultural sites. All right. Um, under the no action and all, al all action alternative, No additional positive or negative impacts are expected beyond those already analyzed in the LTEMP final environmental impact statement for archaeological sites. And we see no changes to available sediment for aeolian
deposits to be transported to um, cover archaeological sites. For the non-bypass alternative, low flows may expose previously inundated historic properties. All right, moving on to environmental justice, which is covered in section 3.16. The issue area for environmental justice is disproportionate effects on minority and low income populations. All 11 counties in the environmental justice study area meet one or more criteria for consideration as EG communities. So um, this one we're gonna spend a little time on. And under the action alternatives, we would see potential impacts to EG communities, but those impacts would vary by alternative. So if we take a, a closer look under the no action alternative, operations would not change and no impacts would occur on environmental justice communities because of, because of the changes to power generation. Under all the cold water alternatives, there would be reduced energy generation and a need for increased replacement energy would result in financial impacts, changes to air quality, changes to tribal resources and changes to regional economic activity. Um, there would also be changes to use and non-use values. For the non-bypass alternative, this would have the least impact on hydropower generation and the least financial impact. There would be a gain in economic value of electrical power that could benefit communities, including environmental justice communities. Most potential impacts on recreation and tribal resources And there would be potential disproportionate adverse impacts for environmental justice communities under this alternative. All right, moving on to hydrologic resources, which are covered in section 3.2. The issue areas covered in the draft SEIS include reservoir elevations, reservoir releases, and river flows. Under the no action alternative, again, operations would not change and there would be no changes to the hydro hydrology. Reservoir elevations and release volumes would follow current trends. Under the cool mix and cold shock alternatives, there would be a temp temporary impacts to the hydrology, but they would not exceed the cumulative impacts on water resources as identified in the LTEMP final environmental impact statement. Under the cool mix and cold shock with flow spike alternative, there would be increased flow rates from flow spikes that could temporarily decrease water sur surface elevations in Lake Powell. These would be short-term and thus no long-term impacts on hydrology are anticipated. For the non-bypass alternative, the minimum and maximum proposed flows would exceed the maximum daily range as developed in the LTEMP rod. Monthly and annual releases would be the same as those under the cold water alternatives. All right, the next resource area that was analyzed is climate, and that is covered in depth in section 3.17. The issue areas there include greenhouse gas emissions from alternate power resources. All right, under the no action alternative, Again, there'd be no change to Glen Canyon operations, and we don't see a change in climate trends as a result of greenhouse gas emissions. Under all the cold water alternatives, hydropower generation would be reduced, and there would be a need to replace that generation with other sources within the 11 state Western interconnection region. These replacement sources including higher cost sources such as coal, natural gas, and oil would result in increased greenhouse gas emissions. And the cool mix alternative shows the largest increase and the cold shock with flow spikes shows the lowest increase. All right, the next um, resource area that we're gonna talk about is socioeconomics and it is covered under section 3.15 
in the draft SEIS. The issue areas include the net value from recreation activities and environmental non-use values. And I just, for everybody's sake, um, can we go back to the last slide? Um, environmental non-use value refers to the worth or value that individuals assign to natural resources or environmental goods. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, for socioeconomics, under the no action alternative, it's an estimated, um, it's estimated that over the 50 month analysis period, there would be a 367 million calculated um, impact for whitewater boaters and a 19 million for anglers. Um, the non-market value, which I should have said uh, on the previous slide, include humpback chub and sandbars. So for the humpback chub, non-native market values decrease in the long term. And for sandbars, high flow experiment releases would continue to impact sandbar development and the associated values. Under all the cold water alternatives, for recreation value, impacts will vary by alternative from minimal changes to small increases in the net value for anglers and white water boaters in all reaches. The non-market values, um, there's the potential for benefits to long-term values associated with humpback chub existence, and there's environmental values associated with the sandbars. For the non-bypass alternative, for recreational value, there would be short-term impacts for angler satisfaction. The high and low fluctuations could impact the boater experience in both Glen Canyon and Grand Canyon reaches. And for non-market values, the short-term impacts on humpback, excuse me, humpback chub juveniles from flow changes. However, we believe these effects to be minimal and that we would see no long-term changes. Trends in sandbar building and the, just for information, sandbars are often used for camping. Um, is similar to the other action alternatives and trends associated with sandbar building would be similar to those produced under the other action alternatives. And as a result, there would be no long-term changes to associated values um, that would be anticipated. Um, for recreation, um, and this is covered in depth in section 3.14, the issue areas include whitewater boating and fishing. Under the no action and all action alternatives, there would be a disruption of Glen Canyon rafting opportunities. And for con concessionaire for rafting visitors. HFE releases would result in a potential increase in camping areas for boaters in the Grand Canyon. For the flow spike alternatives, it's likely to improve whitewater boating conditions in the Grand Canyon, but could temporarily limit beach usability for camping during the implementation of those alternatives. And flow spikes have the highest potential to increase camping areas in the Grand Canyon. Under the non-bypass alternative, the low flows could limit the ability to, for boats to freely navigate in the Glen Canyon reach, and this could adversely impact boating and rafting concessionaires in the short term. In the Grand Canyon, minimum flows would be below safe water minimum that was analyzed in the LTEMP FEIS, and this could adversely affect whitewater boating. With that, I think we have wrapped up the um, resource areas and can move on to ways to comment. Oh, I missed a slide, my apologies. So for fishing, I apologize for jumping past fishing. Under the no action, implementation of HFE releases would continue and could result in reduced short-term angler satisfaction in Glen Canyon. Under the cool mix, reduced water temperatures would improve water quality for rainbow trout. Um, under the cold shock, there would be likely adverse impacts on fry and early juveniles. Cooler water and temperatures could also improve the water quality for rainbow trout. 
Under flow spikes, reduced water temperatures would improve water quality for rainbow trout, but there would be reduced catchability during the peak fishing months. For the non-bypass, fry and juveniles would be negatively affected by both the high and low flows, and rapid fluctuations in water levels could disrupt fishing. There would be less benefit to rainbow trout fisheries because of the reduced water temperatures as compared to the cold water alternatives. All right, now we can move on to ways to comment. Um, there's two different ways to comment. Um, you can send an email to LTEMP, S-E-I-S, all one word, at usbr.gov, or we will accept comments via regular mail and the address is here on the screen. Again, our 45 day public comment period is set to close on March 25th, 2024. For additional information, um, we have posted this information along with the draft SEIS to this website. Um, and I'm not gonna read that, but it's here on the screen for those that are looking. Again, questions can be submitted to the LTEMP SEIS at usbr.gov web email account at any time. And you are free to wel and welcome to reach out to me using the phone number um, that's given, 801-524-3867. Um, we may not be able to take the call, but please leave a message and we will get back to you as, as soon as possible. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah for a question and answer session. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks to you and Bill for um, such a thorough presentation. So folks, we would like na to now open it up uh, for questions um, that you may have um, about uh, the presentation you just heard. Um, this is a period to ask clarifying questions about the presentation and just a reminder that these questions will not be part of the project's um, official record. Um, we encourage you to keep your questions focused and as brief as possible, so we have time to answer just as many as we can in the time that we have left, which is about 30 minutes. Um, we will, um, I'll, I'll go over how to um, ask a question here in just a moment, and I know that we do have one a uh, person joining us by phone. So we'll I'll also be providing some instructions about how to do that. Um, if you are uh, asking your question by phone, we just ask that you speak respectfully. Remember this is a virtual event designed to be uh, heard in homes across the country. Um, profanity is not acceptable. And, and the same goes for questions submitted in writing. And so if you haven't, um, uh, so we covered this at the beginning of the presentation, but just to say again, to ask a written question, um, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you click on that button, a box will pop up. You can type in your question and then click send. Our panel of experts is working behind the scenes to answer your questions. And when those answers are ready, I will read them back out to, uh, to all of you. And I will also share those in writing in the Q&A box. Um, if we get more questions than we have time to uh, address here live, we will be following up with folks um, as needed. And if you are joining us by phone and you would like to ask a question, um, we ask that you press star nine to raise your hand. Um, I'll call on you and then you'll click uh, unmute or star six uh, to unmute and ask your question. So I'll leave this up for just a few minutes and um, I'll actually get quiet and give you a moment to kind of take in what you've heard here today and see if we have any questions.
Uh, Mr. Ellsworth, I do see your hand is up. I'm going to ask if you have a question and you are not joining us by phone only, that you go ahead and type your question into the Q&A. Um, we'll only be hearing verbal questions from folks that are joining us by telephone only. And we do have one question that has come in. So the first question that we've received this after this morning, rather, is uh, how do the cold water alternatives relate to the serious concern about using the river outlets bypass tubes that was described yesterday at the feds tribe states meeting? The concerns described include thinning out excuse me, thinning of the pipe walls, uh, cavitation damage in the outlets, and trail race scour. And our panel um, responds uh, to that uh, with this answer. As has been reported to the Adaptive Management Work Group, Reclamation has been assessing operation of the River Outlet Works, or ROWs, at Glen Canyon Dam. The ROWs are used in high flow experiments and are being considered for use in small mouth bass flows. The modeling assumptions and analysis for this DE uh, draft supplemental EIS include the current best available information regarding the use of the river outlet works, which includes a range of reduced releases through the river outlet works. Additionally, the analysis assumes no high flows below Lake Powell elevations about 3,500 feet. So I'll continue to leave these instructions for how to submit your written questions on the screen. And again, as a reminder, if you're joining us by telephone only, you can dial star nine to raise your hand and we will hear your question out loud. Also just to note um, that some of the uh, pertinent links and information that were shared during the presentation have also been shared in the meeting chat, um, including the address and telephone, excuse me, the address and email address where comments can be submitted, and important links like uh, a link to the draft EIS itself, the LTEMP 2016 record of decision, and the project website. So our next question uh, our next question is as follows. In the AMWG space, we have heard about cativation that occurred in the outlet works during the 2023 high flow event. In a preliminary review of the document, we haven't seen an analysis of how future experiments will affect infrastructure safety and integrity. Will this be added to the final SEIS? So thank you for that question. Our panel's response is that as has been reported to the Adaptive Management Work Group, Reclamation has been assessing operation of the River Outlet Works, ROWs, at Glen Canyon Dam. The ROWs are used in high flow experiments and are being considered for use in smallmouth bass flows. The modeling assumptions and analysis for this draft supplemental EIS include the current best information regarding the use of the river outlet works, which includes a range of reduced releases through the river outlet works. 
Additionally, the analysis assumes no high flows below, below Lake Powell elevation of 3,500. So thank you to those who have submitted questions this morning. Our panel is working on responses uh, right now. And while that's happening, I'm just going to go ahead and um, once again share with you the some information about ways to submit comments on the SEIS. So as Kathy mentioned, you can email lpempseis at usbr.gov. You can also send comments by mail to Bureau of Reclamation, attention, L Temp SEIS Project Manager, 125 South State Street, Suite 800, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84138. I'll leave that address up on the screen in case anyone wants to take note. And of course, a reminder that we are in the 45 day comment period that closes on March 25th, 2024. And I'll also just reshare again, the project website and email address here on the screen. And also a phone number uh, if you do have um, questions that you would like to call in. Um, as Kathy mentioned, um, reclamation is not always available to answer, but they encourage you to leave a message with your question. Okay. So here once again are the instructions for how to use uh, the Q&A button um, to ask a question in writing. And um, I also want to go ahead and share with you another question that has come in. And that question is, uh, notes that economic value and revenue are not sufficient indicators of hydropower impacts and not consistent with L temp. How and when does reclamation plan to provide to the public a full analysis of all hydropower elements consistent with L temp? So thanks for that question. Our panel's response is this. The draft includes economic data using GT Max. We anticipate that more data will be available from additional WAPA modeling in the final. We encourage comments on the analysis that has been provided to date in the draft.
So we'll be here for about another 20 minutes to answer your questions. Encourage you to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can click that button, a box will pop up, type in your question and click send. Our panel is working behind the scenes to answer your questions this morning. So thanks everyone for your patience while we work to answer the questions as they are coming in. The next question we have is this. It says the need used in the slide deck appeared to be different than the need specified in the public draft. The public draft specifies the need as being quote, the need is to disrupt the establishment of smallmouth bass below Glen Canyon Dam by limiting additional recruitment, which could threaten populations of threatened humpback chub below the dam, end quote. This presentation had some reference to, quote, preventing spawning. And the question is, is the need in the public draft correct? So we want to thank you for catching that inconsistency. The purpose and need included in the draft SEIS is correct. And we will be updating that slide for the remaining webinars. And so just a reminder that we'll be here for another 15 minutes or so to answer your questions this morning. If you have a question, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. A box will pop up. You can type in your question and click send. Our panel is working on responses behind the scenes.
If you are joining us by telephone uh, and you have a question, please press star nine to raise your hand. I'll call on you and we'll have you unmute uh, by either clicking unmute or uh, star six. And while we're waiting to see if any more questions come in, I will go ahead and just share again uh, the ways to comment on the draft uh, SEIS. You can comment by sending an email to ltempseis at usbr.gov. You can also comment through the regular mail by mailing your comment to Bureau of Reclamation Attention, L. Temp, SEIS Project Manager, 125 South State Street, Suite 800, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84138. The comment period closes on March 25th, 2024. So once again, we will be here um, for the next, oh, just uh, 13 or so minutes until 1130 Mountain Time um, to take your questions. Um, if you have questions, please use that Q&A bot button at the bottom of the screen um, to submit them to us. And so for anyone who is curious, we had a question um, about whether these slides would be available. Um, yes, the PowerPoint will be available um, on the web on the project website uh, following this presentation. Um, so I've gone ahead and um, posted the project website on the screen once again. Um, and so yeah, excuse me, my um, just to just to clarify there, the slides will be available following the third and final presentation um, of the series. Uh, and so I'll just kind of use this opportunity to also remind you that there are two additional uh, public meetings coming up. Um, there will be another one held on Tuesday, February 20th. 
starting at 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time. And then a third one on Thursday, February 22nd, uh, from noon to 1.30 Mountain Time. And so we would just encourage you to check back on the project website. To look for this slide deck. So with about five minutes left, I just want to make sure um, we share one more time that there are a few ways to comment. Um, you can comment on the LTEMP SEIS uh, via email, 
to the email address on your screen. I've said it a couple of times here this after this morning, rather. And I think we also shared that in the chat. Or by mail um, to the address on the screen that was also shared earlier uh, out loud and has also been shared in the chat. So hopefully um, everyone who needs it has been able to capture that information. The 45 day comment period closes on March 25th, 2024. And if you have um, additional questions after this meeting, um, you can send them to that email address or call Kathy at the number on your screen. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Reclamation may not always be able to answer the phone, but we, it, you are encouraged to leave a message. We also encourage you to visit the project website for additional information about the project um, to access relevant documents um, and to access these slides following, uh, following our presentation, uh, I think the, um, the third one. And then just a final reminder that there are additional public meetings being held next week. So one will be held on Tuesday, February 20th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Mountain Time. And another one on Thursday, February 22nd uh, from noon to 1.30 Mountain Time. Information on registration for those events uh, is also on the project's website. And so with just a couple of minutes left in our time together, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy to give some closing remarks. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the NEPA process um, ensures that we engage the public in the environmental process and the decision making process. And it's very important to us um, to engage you and to receive your comments. And so I would like to encourage everybody, please submit comments um, under the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. We're required to respond to all questions we receive on the draft SEIS, and we will include those responses in the final SEIS. Um, as a reminder as well, um, we are targeting a final environmental impact statement in May. 2024 with a 30 day review period and um, the earliest a rod would be available would be in June. Um, and again, yeah, thank you for the schedule. Just a reminder. So again, thank you for participating today and we look forward to the comments we receive and just want to again, thank everybody um, for making this process as easy as as it has been. Um, doing a supplemental EIS in this time frame is not easy, but um, we have a great group of partners, contractors, staff members. Um, the comments we received during the scoping period. Um, and so we appreciate your participation and look forward to the comments we'll be receiving. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy, and thank you everyone who took time out of your busy schedules to join us this morning for this uh, webinar. Um, we appreciate your attention and all of your questions. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>